uh, what am I going to talk about? So I guess my name's Jeff, uh, and I'm a little disappointed I wasn't introduced as part of the next generation. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm like one year older than you. <laughs> but uh, you know, I'm an NVDA trainer, which is Nonviolent Direct Action. I've been doing that for about 10 years. Uh, and I came here to New Zealand to work for Greenpeace as my day job. Uh, but on the weekends, I like to be involved with fun grassroots stuff, um, like the Mole Project and Real Choice. Um, but I don't have enough time to talk about myself, but I really like complex systems, um, and that's what I'm going to talk about, is we can think about social change as a network, a network of people and how they interact. So the big problem for me is that we have these brains, they're amazing, and they can solve problems, uh, but they basically just solve the simple problems, like we can make iPhones, uh, we can solve you know, localized things, but what about the big problems, like climate change, poverty, health, inequality, sexism, and these other ones that are you know, international, complex problems, how do we solve those? We have a lot of trouble with that. Um, so I'm going to think about networks, I'm going to think about complex system dynamics, uh, and about direct action and how these all work together. <coughs> so I'm going to offer two different perspectives to look at our movement, um, and you can take them or leave them, and I'm going to combine them at the end to give you sort of my theory of change. So the first thing is when you talk about a network, so a network can be a network of computers, um, or, but I'm going to think about a network of people and how they connect and how they interact. So networks have structure. Um, and we invented this really cool thing over the last few hundred years called a centralized system. We've all been familiar with them. It's pretty cool. So there's a central body that controls most of the system. Uh, think about a corporation. So in management, we have an executive that controls uh, most of the workers. In the military, they use command and control. Governments, we have parliament. In media, we used to use newspapers and television. We broadcast it out to the masses. And that's how things were done. And it was really effective. Um, but what we're seeing is a big change. Oh, sorry. One extra slide. Um, and we use that as activists. So we created centralized organizing. So we drew a big circle around a centralized network and called it an NGO or a political party or a union. And we did some really cool things over the last hundred years. But networks are changing. And so we're seeing these brand new types of networks growing and becoming very, very big. So we're seeing decentralized networks where you have nodes. Um, and we're seeing distributed networks where there's no central hub. Uh, I'll go more into that. So distributed, and I'm going to say that not all systems, this is one criticism I'll worry about, is that not everything's going to change. There's still going to be centralized networks for a very, very long time. Um, but these new ones are popping up. So distributed structure, uh, one of the big things about it is it doesn't have a central hub. So if you take out any single point in the network, the network's fine, it rocks on. Um, we don't have a uh, division of role. So in a centralized system, you'll have producers that make the thing you have consumers over here that consume the thing. Um, in these type of networks, we see this new dynamic where people participate as both a consumer and a producer, so they call it a prosumer. Um, and this information isn't selected and broadcasted, it moves virally, so the network decides, um, each hub in the network decides whether or not to pass on the information. And so what we see is something called viral spreading. It's a brand new thing. And these networks are everywhere, so Facebook, um, for, for media and social media, uh, Uber, Airbnb if you're getting a hotel room, or even the Occupy movement. These are all new distributed structures. Moving on. So network connections. So we have structure and we also have connections. And if you're a geek, you call it network degree. So how many connections does each person have in your social network? So let's look at the connections. A simple network, imagine this is a small community. You can look at it if you're in the community. You basically know how it works, who's friends with who. Uh, and where the power lies, and you know where cause and effect is, so you know how to persuade people and get things done. But if we crank it up a bit, and we add a few extra connections, add a few extra people, it starts to get a bit messy, we call this a complicated system. So a complicated system, it looked hard at first, but actually it's not so bad. If you become an expert, or you're an analyst, you can make sense of this system, you can discover cause and effect, and you can campaign in that environment. And that's what we've become used to, so most NGOs campaign in complicated systems, against parliaments, against corporations, where it's a bit hard at first, but with a bit of study, you can figure it out and you can change them. But what we're seeing with the internet is that more and more people are joining the network, and each person is connected to more and more people. You can imagine the community, 100 years ago, maybe you, you knew dozens of people, 100 people, 500 people. Um, that was what networks used to be. Now on Facebook, I've got 1,000 friends. Um, and when I broadcast something, it can get shared and tens of thousands of people Tens of thousands of people might see it, so this is brand new. Personally, I could be connected to hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of people. So now our networks are starting to look like this. And they're complex, and they're difficult to understand. And what it means is that cause and effect is really dramatically changing. So the big thing about a complex network 
is that cause and effect, so a single event will have millions of causes. It will have tens or hundreds or thousands, which maybe we can understand. It has millions of causes, and we can, we, our brains just can't handle it. So how do we deal with this? So what happens from our perspective as a human, we can't understand this. So cause and effect breaks down. We can't predict the future. We can't know what's going to happen tomorrow in these networks. Um, causality is only visible in hindsight. The relationships of causality are constantly changing as the network changes. Um, and there's feedback loops between cause and effect. Because something happens today, tomorrow it could be more likely or less likely just because it happened. Um, ooh, very, it, yeah, it's very difficult to deal with. So the big lessons about complex systems is that the past does not always predict the future. It can sometimes, but we can't be certain. Um, that the systems are constantly changing uh, and that traits and the really amazing parts of these networks emerge. They come out of nowhere. So I'll dwell on that for just a second. So emergence is this notion of a tipping point. So um, a tipping point, which is Malcolm Gladwell's book, where a network will just dramatically change. So our model of thinking in the world is that things change linearly, like in a complicated system. So things get better one day, they get a little bit better the next day, and eventually you reach the end goal where it's 100% better. Um, in a complex system, that's not what happens. The system will remain stable, it will be getting pressure, and then one day you'll wake up and it will just dramatically change. Um, and so that's called an emergence. So it's a quick change to another stable state. So where do we see this? Um, in the Occupy movement. So if I went around the world and I studied every anti-capitalist and I got to know them all, the day before the Occupy movement, I couldn't have predicted it. Um, we look at this with market crashes. So we constantly have different types of market crashes that come from different regions, from different places in the world, and are unpredictable. The consciousness of the human mind and other minds, if we studied a neuron, totally, and we understand every aspect about it, we understood all of its connections, we couldn't predict consciousness. Um, and the same thing comes for movements. Um, the movements come out of nowhere when they change the world, and that's what, that's what I'm interested in looking at, is how we can solve those big problems. So the solutions to bigger issues, they emerge. They can't really be planned. We don't really know where they come from. So how can we enhance emergence? So complex networks. How do we operate as an activist in this type of an environment? So I've got a few principles, um, which are my suggestions of what we can do. So if we cannot predict um, what will be the outcomes of our actions, our past ideas may or may not work, and we can't control the network, it's too big, how do we operate? Here's a few principles. Um, and this is what we try to run our real choice by uh, and other activist groups. We're experimenting with these principles and we're seeing what we can do uh, with them. So the first one uh, is funny, it's, it's be humble. So because we don't know what's really gonna work, We've got to try new things, but we've also got to give up our ideas and go with what works when we see someone else doing it. So go with what's working um, and, and uh, accept other theories of change. Um, take a network perspective. So build networks, not groups. So sometimes when you're building a group, you have a banner, you have a brand, um, you're not necessarily growing a network. You're capturing a network under your umbrella, under your banner, and you think that's the way to change the world. Um, and that's how we used to do it when we had centralized systems and the bigger a centralized system was, the stronger it was. But now we take a network orientation, we just want to make the network bigger. We want to bring more people into activism um, and lower the barriers uh, and bring people in. So make the network bigger. Connections. So if I was to describe the activist, uh, the Auckland Activist Network, uh, it would look like this. So uh, you'd have some big groups, you'd have some small groups. And they're not really talking to each other, but there's a few popular people um, that move between the groups to keep the uh, information flowing. Um, but what we could do is we could build more connections in our network, we could squish it together, we could get people talking to each other, um, we could increase the complexity of the network. And what that will do is it means information can freely flow throughout the network and talk to everyone. It increases the chances of emergence within the network, and it means the right ideas are more likely to be, to be selected and become um, common. Because maybe if the right idea was in some tiny part of the network that's isolated, that little group found out, but no one else is going to find out about it. The next thing is have a crazy, beautiful vision. So only vision can align a network. You can't control the network like we used to with centralized system. So having a vision for the future you want to see will align people behind you. So always vision over control. Um, the hardest thing is how do we select projects? How do we know what to go with if we're a network? Are we going to have a big conference and argue for hours like a coalition? Uh, no, we have to trust the crowd. So we use individual self-selection. So people work on what they want to work on. They vote with their feet. And what individual self-selection does 
uh, or it needs, sorry, is it needs transparency. So everyone in the group needs to know what the group's doing and all the information so they can make good decisions. We have to truly trust them to make their own decision and not try to control them. And they have to actually have the choice. And what this means is that when a good idea is pitched, a few people will gather behind it, it gains momentum, and eventually the whole network will find out, and we have a blockade. <laughs> Uh, the last thing, uh, the title of my history of direct action, is about taking meaningful action. Um, and that I mean direct action in the public um, that's often challenging things. Uh, it could be a lot of different forms. But the thing about taking action is that we don't want to get stuck thinking. We can't predict the future. We don't know what's going to work. So let's do something. Let's be vulnerable. Let's tell a story and shake things up. Because in a network, you don't know what the effects are going to be. Um, there's a metaphor of a butterfly's wings causing a hurricane. That's not totally accurate, but in the sense we don't know the effects of our actions, so let's just start doing things and take the feedback. So watch what's happening. Don't just you know, chase cars and do random things. Try stuff out and go with what works. So those are the five principles I came up with. Uh, be humble, take a network perspective, have a crazy beautiful vision, trust the crowd, uh, and take me.